Hereby I open this academic ceremony in which Ricky Janssen will defend the academic thesis Caring Together with Digital Technology, exploring HIV self-testing practices with an app called HIV Smart. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Dear Prorector, members of the assessment committee, supervisors, family, friends, and colleagues. I will now take this opportunity happily to share more about my PhD research with you all. First, I'd like you to take a moment. Imagine doing a COVID-19 self-test. Perhaps you read the instructions first, then you swab the back of your throat or put the swab up your nose, then you add the swab to buffer liquid. You put some of the liquid on a test strip and you wait for a line or lines to appear. But my guess is this isn't all you're doing during this moment. You're also thinking, hmm, do I have any symptoms? Do I know someone who's sick? <clears throat> you're also thinking about whether you can go to work that day or if you can take your kids to daycare. Luckily, only one line appears and you give a sigh of relief. But then you think, hmm, did I take the test too early? Maybe I should actually uh, Google how accurate this test is. I use this example because it's relatable. It illustrates the complexity of using a self-test. You're not just doing the test, reading the instructions, and reading the result. You're also thinking about certain concerns, you have feelings, and particular uncertainties. This complexity might seem obvious to you now because I've asked you to think about your personal experiences. But the complexity of self-testing is often something that gets overlooked. My PhD research wasn't on COVID-19 self-testing. It was on HIV self-testing. HIV and COVID are very different viruses, not just biologically, but also socially, politically, and historically. Over the last decade, as part of WHO policy priorities, We've seen that countries have been trying to work to increase the number of people who know their HIV status. This is a way of ensuring that we try and increase the number of people on treatment, therefore reducing the number of new transmissions and overall new infections. HIV testing is regarded as part of the, the way we're going to actually reach some of these goals. In my research, I studied how people worked with an oral HIV self-test. Now, this test works by rubbing up along the top and bottom of your gums, putting the swab in a buffer liquid, and then waiting for a result. But historically, HIV self-testing, or sorry, HIV testing, happens alongside counseling from a healthcare professional. So when HIV self-testing gained traction, this became a concern. 
Responding to a gap in counseling and support for HIV self-testing. Responding to this gap in counseling and support in HIV self-testing, Dr. Natika Pampai was thinking about how to solve this. She was in Montreal, and since 2009, she's been working to develop an app called HIV Smart. This app was designed to provide guidance on doing support and interpreting an HIV test. It was meant to give people a risk assessment, provide counseling on what to do based on the result, and it was also meant to play a role in linking people to further care to local healthcare facilities. Now, this is where my research began. I went to South Africa in 2017 to actually study the research that they were doing. I researched the researchers and also wanted to look at how people were working with her app and the self-test. Therefore, my research questions were as follows. One, to explore the role of HIV Smart and how people do HIV self-testing and good HIV care. And two, to explore what it takes to make this digital health strategy and self-test work in practice across different contexts. I also wanted to know which actors would be involved in this process. I conducted field work over 2017 and 2018. And in my research, I focused on how people did things. I wasn't so concerned about the numbers that were generated through the larger research study that was going on. Rather, I wanted to know about care practices. I wanted to know how different stakeholders were working with the oral self-test and app. I wanted to know about their stories, what they did in HIV self-testing previously, and what they experienced through using this technology. I did 51 interviews with study staff and research participants in South Africa. I also did a focus group discussion with nurses and healthcare workers who were working on the study. I spent time at the clinic having informal chats with people, watching how they worked with this technology, and wanted to know how this research process was being carried out. I also spent a bit of time in Montreal. I did some interviews there with study staff who had previously worked on this research and talked to a few people who had actually worked with the app after the study had already been concluded. I wanted to get further insight in how this technology had traveled between places and how the app had developed and been used between contexts. Now, if I look at my findings, we think about this app and self-test um, and the context I was working in. Now, I work from the lens of STS, and through this disciplinary lens, we see that technologies always have certain ideas and values built into them. For the case of the app and self-test, we can think of uh, values like privacy and autonomy, the ability to use the test on your own in a private space of your choice without the supervision of a healthcare provider. But when a technology is used in practice, the idea of how it was meant to work and the values that are built into the technology don't necessarily play out the way that we think they will or that the designer intended. Now, HIV Smart traveled between places, from Dr. Pampai's lab to people's clinics in Montreal to Cape Town and then to people's homes. These places are different in very many ways. I was working with different communities who had different histories, as well as different healthcare infrastructures and resources. HIV was not approved for use in Montreal at the time of the research back in 2015, so the testing had to be done in a clinic. People couldn't take the self-test home with them. Now, this had changed when we went to South Africa. HIV self-testing had been improved in 2016, and the research team was very excited about this. This was the first opportunity they had to actually use tests like this in people's homes with the app. The idea in South Africa was as follows. There were three clinics um, in which the app was used. Nurses and healthcare workers who were working in the research study were meant to download the app on people's phones and then they could take them home with them. But like I said, things don't always work out in practice the way that we think they will. So although that app was meant to be taken home by people, the research team quickly realized, well, not everyone has a phone. The app doesn't always download the way we think it will because it's working on a different operating system perhaps than the phone people have. The other issue is that some people actually wanted support. They wanted to use a self-test and do the app, but they weren't sure that they wanted to do it completely alone. So they wanted a healthcare worker there to help them. 
The other issue was we assumed that people would have private space. It's nice to do things at home, but a lot of the spaces where people lived were very crowded, and being at home didn't necessarily mean you had private space to do this. So what we saw was a lot of work and organization went into aligning and providing flexibility in the study. The research team helped make the app and self-test work in the Cape Town context. They provided tablets on which to do the app at the clinic. Private spaces were made available around the clinic where people could work with the self-test and app either alone or with the support of a nurse or healthcare worker. This work by the research team and the additional resources provided through the study created a flexible self-test approach that fit the needs of different research participants. After all, the goal of the research team wasn't necessarily just to see how the app was working. Their goal was to provide good HEV care to their participants. This was their main concern. Now, HIV self-testing is a loaded experience. It's emotional. And you want someone there who's going to support you through this process. You also want a good relationship with that person. But in the case of the app, you don't have a person there. You have a technology. So I wanted to know what it felt like to work with the app. For some of the HIV start smart study participants that I spoke to in Cape Town, the fact that it was an app guiding through, them, through the process was actually really important. It was a technology, not a person. They felt like the technology couldn't judge them in the same way that a person might. Yet in other moments, the app had limitations. This frustrated people. For one particular woman I can remember seeing in the clinic, she didn't agree with the risk assessment that the app had given her. It didn't match up with what she saw as about her own personal risk. This showed a limitation of the approach. The app couldn't have an interactive discussion with a person. So building relationships in this case was difficult. But there, in moments such as this, healthcare staff from the research team could step in and provide cl further clar clarification. Therefore, it wasn't just the app and self-test that contributed to people's positive self-testing experiences with HIV SMART. It was the entire group of people, things, and spaces that brought together in the HIV SMART, were brought together in the HIV SMART approach to make it successful. Similar to my example with COVID-19 testing at the beginning, people also drew on their knowledge about testing, previous HIV testing experiences, knowledge on their own risk behavior, local testing advice, and symptoms when interpreting the test. They also considered results given by additional blood-based tests that were part of the research study. They talked to research staff, and they often got confirmation or reassurances from the nurses and healthcare workers on the research team. This process of knowing one's HIV status and test interpretation was therefore an ongoing process and involved lots of different things. In addition, The way that the research team worked and understood the app also changed. This for me was also important. The app wasn't just easy to use for people. What I realized through the testing process was that as the staff got to know the app better, used it more, and worked through the bugs in the app, they could also explain it to research participants in different ways. What the app was and what it did were not fixed and stable in the research. This shows the changing nature of digital health and self-testing. I would argue that the notion that technologies change and that the role that they play change as they are put into practice are things that we can actually rely on outside of the research environment. Technologies are going to change, they can't remain stable, and therefore we have to rethink the methods that we use when we actually evaluate them in the research context. Research and evaluation need to get better at actually acknowledging and reporting on how digital technologies and the people and things around them work and change over time to produce certain results. Now I'm going to talk briefly about some of the main findings and conclusions of my research. One, designing, implementing, and evaluating technologies are not separate steps. Now, they're not linear, but I'd also say they're not even cyclical. They often happen simultaneously. Researchers and implementers need to use data collection and reporting methods which better acknowledge how technology, the role it plays, and the people and things around it develop over time and throughout the research and implementation process. This way we can reflect on these processes, think about the pro uh, novel practices that are made when we're doing research, 
and think about what this means for future implementation of these technologies. Next, we need to do research that better reflects how technologies are adapted and aligned to work better in practice in specific places. Technology does not work on its own. This aligning takes considerable time and effort by the people working with the technology. It also requires human and physical resources to do this. Digital technology is often framed as a way of making healthcare more efficient or cost effective. But my research shows that it actually takes a lot of time and resources to make things work well. But it isn't only about making the technology work, it's also about providing care. HIV Smart contributed to care as part of a bigger team of people and things, including healthcare workers, nurses, additional testing methods, physical spaces, the person's own experiences, their family and their friends. Researchers, implementers and policymakers need to think about how to make digital health technology achieve goals as a member of a broader healthcare team. Again, an app can't do everything, though it can contribute. If we are serious about creating and implementing digital health and self-testing technologies, we need to think about the time, effort, collaboration and resources necessary to make these technologies work in practice across different places in a way in which they contribute to care and make care possible. I thank you for your attention. I now give the word back to the pro-rector and I'd also like to thank some of the uh, other people that we've worked to and with and have been very important in this project. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very clear. Um, we start now with the opposition. And the first opponent is Professor Huber. Professor Huber is Professor of Social Medicine in particular Infectious Disease Control at Maastricht University. Thank you. Thank you, dear candidate. Uh, it was absolutely a pleasure for me to read your thesis and I congratulate you with this uh, well-written manuscript. And I also want to involve, uh, of course, your supervision team in these compliments. So uh, well done uh, for now already. Um, you address a very interesting and relevant uh, topic in your thesis, the use of digital technology in health, specifically focused on HIV, which is also nicely depicted and artfully depicted actually on the cover of your thesis. Um, and of course, uh, as we are the opponents, we want to discuss with you a few uh, topics, and that's also what I'm going to do. Um, I start actually with the context of COVID, as you also already start already in your presentation. Um, and you start in your introduction also with a quote of the Wall Street uh, Journal, which states that the COVID-19 pandemic has hastened consumers' willingness to test for more medical conditions at home. And test makers said expanding the market for self-diagnostic products. And that's actually what we saw, of course. Um, during the first years of COVID, we have seen massive testing uh, for COVID in all kinds of public health services. But especially in the past year, we have seen massive rise in the use of COVID self-tests. How do you think this massive use of self-testing during COVID waves affect the self-testing willingness in HIV? And can you say something about the pros and the cons uh, on this? Highly esteemed opponent, I thank you for your compliments and for something that I think is a very important thing to address. Um, I think one of the pros is that people might be more used to using these tests. It's really interesting because through HIV self-testing as it's come up through the last 10 years, there's always these concerns that people think, oh, people don't know how to use these tests properly. They're not gonna be able to interpret it properly. Uh, no, we really need to have a healthcare pre worker present to actually make this work and to ensure that people get back into care. So I was a bit shocked actually when COVID-19 happened and self-tests were just everywhere because I thought, well, where's all the concern gone? Um, people were so worried about this, you know, and of course still remembering that HIV and COVID are very different things, um, sure. but I thought it was interesting. So in terms of pros, I think actually healthcare and um, public health, people working in public health, might also be more willing to suggest these kinds of tests to people. So that's one thing uh, as a stakeholder. I think people maybe are more used to using these kinds of tests and, and know that they can use them at home and they can talk to people about it perhaps. Um, one of the cons of this is I think it might detract from the kinds of continuum of care that we need 
to actually make these self-tests work. So, and by that I mean ensuring that we have clinics with lots of staff because we're not going to just not need healthcare staff anymore. Mm -hmm. This is going to include task shifting. So now we pe have people doing more tests at home, but they're still going to need follow-up testing, so confirmatory testing. You might exactly, also because that was of course also what we see in uh, COVID testing that many people still want this confirmatory testing, and exactly. that will probably be certainly the case in HIV. Yeah. So. In terms of cons, I think we have to remember that there's still going to be lots of testing infrastructure necessary to make this work, and that healthcare staff is going to be yeah, present to actually help people who need further clarification. But in terms of pros, I think uh, healthcare staff are more willing to let people use these kinds of tests and encourage people to use these kinds of tests, and that people might also be more willing to use them at home now that they've used other kinds of testing methods for other viruses. Thank you. Yeah, I want to go to another topic and that's that of course you described an app designed for a person so through a whole testing process uh, providing counseling information risk assessment uh, support in conducting and interpreting the HIV self-test but of course uh, in public health we have many so to say single issue interventions um, and of course we could fill our mobile phone with many apps uh, not only on HIV, but all kinds of. So um, you address actually in your uh, thesis the different stages of uh, the process steps you, yeah, you have to follow for good self-testing. So should it be, be a good idea to have a kind of app for self-testing in general with maybe modules like HIV, but also maybe other STI for instance, then only an app for HIV especially, as you mentioned, the changing nature of digital uh, health solutions, uh, that you already know about this app, and now it's for HIV, but you can also recognize it for other issues. Uh, highly esteemed opponent. I, I think that this is also interesting. To be honest, I haven't actually thought about what that would look like. I think one of the issues with HIV is that people recognize this as a large concern. And when you're someone who's HIV testing regularly, I think knowing that the app has been designed specifically with that issue in mind gives it a certain kind of confidence. So people are very wary of HIV testing already, and knowing that it's someone who's been intimately uh, kind of involved in the design process only thinking of HIV might give it a bit more, yeah, credibility. On the other hand, people who are testing for HIV are often also testing for other types of STIs. So I think maybe including this as a sexual and reproductive health app with those kinds of things in mind, that might also be something. I think if you open an app and you have every kind of self-test under the sun, so to say, that might be a bit overwhelming. So I think we also have to think how people match up different self-testing um, needs. What makes sense to put together in an app and what kind of confidence does that instill in the user? Yeah, and then you mentioned also the additional resources that are needed to guide people, of course, to this app. So there are certain limitations to probably the many the possibilities in one app. Yeah, yes. that's right. Thank you. Uh, maybe a last question, and that's actually about trust, uh, which is quite an issue, of course, when talking about using apps. Although um, you already mentioned, actually, the, the, the changing nature of digital health solutions. But uh, we can also see that the uh, trust is something that is not static. Uh, especially, we, had, we, we know about a lot of studies done during COVID times that you can see that trust, for instance, in uh, COVID testing, but also in uh, vaccination, or et cetera, are rising and falling uh, over time. What do you think that will, uh, how, how will that be addressed with such an app? Uh, and especially thinking about uh, who's the one that's uh, hosting such an app? For instance, is it more public uh, oriented or is it more commercial, uh, commercially available? Could you say some thoughts about that uh, and how that issue, yeah, the trust issue is uh, related to the, the app? I think this is a really important question. Um, and one of the answers is I think that we have to look at the community partners that are already working with these kinds of populations who are HIV testing a lot or maybe who aren't HIV testing a lot but we know would want to if, if things felt more safe. Um, I know in a lot of other research, and something I noticed also too when I was talking to participants, is the clinic was somewhere where people wanted to access some of these tests, but that wasn't the right thing for everyone. 
Um, you might think about gyms, community centers. I think there would have to be very detailed contextual research done speaking to people or different stakeholders who might want to use these tests about where are places where you feel safe, where are places that you feel community and accepted. Um, when I was working in Montreal, one of the people I spoke to, and I still remember this conversation really vividly, he said one of the issues where I was living in, in northern rural Quebec, is there was no gay community. The tests were available at the hospital, and I hate, he hated going to the hospital um, because he wanted to go somewhere that actually had services that were provided and shaped around his needs. Mm -hmm. So I think if these were going to be provided, they'd have to be provided through services that were already trusted within the community, mm -hmm. um, and these things do change, like you said. So this wouldn't be a one-off. I think there would have to be a consistent participatory kind of discussion going on with the community to say, are things still working? Do we need to change things? Or do we need to maybe provide these services in different ways? And again, that also takes a lot of resources. Thank you very much for this uh, answer. And I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you very much, Professor Huber. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Van Hooijwegen. Professor Van Hooijwegen is Professor of Sociology of Science, Technology and Medicine at the KU Leuven in Belgium. Professor Van Hooijwegen. Thank you. Dear candidate, uh, dear Ricky, um, very happy to be here today as a member of your PhD jury. And also I want to congratulate you with your PhD work. I was very impressed. Uh, reading through the close study you did on the interaction between people and the new HIV Smart app. Um, well, um, this topic of, of digital health, implementation of digital health technology is of high relevance uh, today by global, uh, in global policy making, but there are of course uh, uh, some challenges and barriers to do with this implementation of such an app. And my questions uh, today to you, I would like to intervene uh, with you on these more broader ethical and regulatory aspects around uh, the implementation of this app. <clears throat> so, well, my first question actually deals with key ethical challenges uh, related to HIV testing itself uh, and, uh, and then uh, the application of the digital health app. So in chapter two, you mentioned in regard to the South African context, some, uh, some of these key challenges uh, which impede the pace of progress of HIV testing. Uh, you mentioned the important uh, issue of stigma and discrimination, and also the perceived lack of privacy and confidential confidentiality for healthcare workers. For me, it's intriguing to see how the objective of the app was actually, is actually framed as a way to overcome these key challenges of HIV testing. Uh, like you write in chapter two, uh, the strategy presents a potential way of circumventing these challenges by allowing people to test alone at home. And also in your empirical data, this becomes uh, very uh, clear. Um, and you show how, I quote again, this new HV, HIVST strategy, which uses a confidential smartphone application, helps users complete an oral HIV testing strategy. But how confidential can an app be? Uh, I relate here to your chapter three title. You're only there on the phone, just trusting the phone. My question is, but can a phone be trusted? Um, so I'm referring here to the challenges related to digital privacy of uh, apps uh, versus the real life privacy aspects that you describe in your PhD that the app would overcome, like the local physical presence of healthcare workers or the physical presence of a, uh, a sister, I remember, or an uncle in the room and so on. And as um, LC scholars in digital health uh, have argued, uh, there are some challenges indeed uh, to do with um, digital health privacy. And although we have uh, important regulation uh, in place, for example, in Europe, we have the GDPR regulation. Um, these scholars also show that there are pertaining issues um, uh, with these digital health technologies. 
and I name some few. Uh, first of all, there is an issue of reuse of data, of uh, the data of an app like the HIV Smart app. For example, reuse by insurers. And this is particularly salient in the context of South Africa, where we have a long history of discrimination issues in insurance and HIV related to the specific insurance context uh, in South Africa. There is also the role of big data and the reappropriation of the, of the data in the app, uh, by whom is it used. And people are speaking of a societal spillover as uh, effects of an app, where an app like HIV Smart is used here in a clinical setting, but where again the data is reappropriated for predictive modeling uh, in other studies, clinical studies, but in all, uh, also in other societal uh, contexts and institutions. So my question for you here are, have you been confronted in your empirical data with ethical issues related to digital privacy? For example, concerns raised by respondents themselves about this app in their life and the use of this app. Uh, can a phone be trusted? Secondly, I ask you, have you taken into account uh, pertaining regulations in the specific national context to do with privacy and non-discrimination uh, in the context of South Africa and Canada. And secondly, more uh, situated, uh, this is a question on the background of your own study. Um, I did not find much information about the app itself uh, in the study. Uh, and I was wondering who is the owner of the app? What is being done with the data uh, from the app? Uh, has there been a, any data management plan, uh, ethical approval, and so on? Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, I thank you for this, again, very crucial and important set of questions. Um, I think first I'll talk about the concerns raised by respondents in my empirical material. What I found interesting is it did get mentioned once in a while. I remember someone asking to, you know, where does this information go? Oh, I hope I don't get it confused with my social media. Um, yeah, but that, to be honest, was almost the end of it. One of the things I think about this is it was in a research context, right? So this was a one-time use app. Um, and at the time, because it was in a research context, participants were completely anonymized. So this was kind of held in a, in, a, in a closed system, so to say. They weren't using their real uh, name. Um, and I know that the researchers went through great lengths to ensure that this was kept in a very secure database and went through very, very many steps to ensure that that happened. Um, interestingly, one of the things that I saw too was that people actually shared phones sometimes. So there were participants who brought the phone in and the other partner didn't have the phone, so they'd actually download the app and use it, both of them, on the same phone. So there were people who were comfortable also sharing this data because I don't think it's only about um, insurance companies, for example, but it's also about who's in your house, who has access to your phone, what if your phone gets lost or stolen. So I think there would definitely have to be, if this was um, scaled up further, certain kinds of safety protocols put in to ensure that people don't have access to your testing information. Now, another thing I would like to say in terms of pertaining to insurers having access to reuse the data, um, my personal opinion around this is, is that this should be completely centered in public health. Um, this shouldn't be something that's privatized. So this should be provided as a clinic service. Personally, that's what I think. Um, and that, again, this is about instilling trust and confidence in people who are using the app. Who has access to my data? That shouldn't be something they should have to worry about. To be honest, I didn't look so much at regulations pertaining to this in South Africa and Canada because most of what I did was kind of geared towards what participants were also talking to me about their concerns. And in the care practice, as I was seeing, this wasn't actually something that came up a lot. This isn't to say that that isn't an important issue. I absolutely think it is. But for me, it was also about seeing how the app actually was integrated or reconfigured practices of care. Um, and because data management and, and data privacy wasn't something that seemed to be concerned for the participants, um, it wasn't something I followed because that wasn't part of the concerns or things that were made to matter through the way that they were doing these kinds of HIV self-tests. Again, I think because this is in a research context, 
that might have added a layer perhaps of safety to the situation. So should we look further about maybe implementing or scaling this up, I think that would be an issue. Now, this is an open access app. Um, it was developed by Dr. Natika Pampai, uh, and it's owned, I believe, by herself and Grand Challenges Canada, Canada who also um, uh, financed this research. I think part of making sure that it was open access was to also ensure that people who wanted to use the app or maybe public health or governments who couldn't afford to use this kinds of technologies could also use it and try and scale it up in what way they saw fit. Again, this becomes an issue if we think about privacy and data management, um, but for me, wasn't the necessarily the focus in terms of how we looked at care practices because that wasn't something that participants spoke about a lot. Did I answer just checking because there was quite a few questions in there. Uh, I hope I answered all your questions. You did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope I have time for a second question. Actually, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry to. <laughs> but we continue with the next opponent, uh, which is uh, Dr. Mesmon. She's Associate Professor of Anthropology of Science, Technology and Medicine at Maastricht University. The candidate, the uh, Ricky. I too would like to congratulate you. This is a very nice piece of scholarly work. And I also would like to congratulate both of your supervisors. It was uh, a joy to read. Your writing style is really uh, very special, very clear. And yeah, I think we all know to write clear requires a thorough um, insight in the matter of research. So it, it also reflects uh, how much you are into your own topic. I'm also impressed by the richness of your data and the detailed description of your observations. And it too, I think, reflects a high level of your competence as, as being an ethnographer. So my compliments. I would like to discuss with you um, two things, but let's see how, uh, <laughs> how we manage. <laughs> and uh, the first one I would like to discuss is the issue of the binary. In your dissertation, you um, use the more than human approach, and you also present the test, the, the self-test, not so much as a technology, but as an assemblage. And you, you do that very well. And what I really like is that um, you also go beyond the standard binaries. So instead of saying, OK, people use it alone or with the help of others, they use it at home or in the clinic, you show that they use it alone with the help of others. They use it in outside the clinic while within the clinical context. So you really go beyond the binary. And that's quite something because a lot of people talk about let's go beyond binary, but you actually do it. But there's one thing that's still there and it's quite a strong binary and it's the one that is about uh, development and implementation. So this is quite striking, considering your very critical analysis, in which you show that everything is interrelated, co-constituted, everything is changing in flux and fluid. So you can imagine that with this critical analytical approach, you, that would also have dissolved this dichotomy between development and implementation and be replaced by other ways of thinking. For instance, the idea of Teun Zuider and Jerak uh, preventing implementation, which articulates the entire process as a more, in a more procedural character. In a way, it makes me curious um, about the basis of your decision to stick to this structure of development and implementation, or for that matter, implementation and evaluation. Can you please help me to solve this uh, problem? I thank you, esteemed opponent, for this question. Um, well, actually, I agree with you, so that's a, a nice place to start. Um, and I don't try to necessarily create a, bi a binary between development and implementation. And I think I really show this in chapter five. Mm -hmm. So in chapter five, when I'm talking about the fact that the app was constantly changing through this process. So it was developing through the research mm -hmm. because things would come up. It wouldn't download properly on the phone, perhaps because it was too big. And the designer would say, okay, well then maybe we can shrink the app. 
then that would create new problems because the app wouldn't download for other reasons. And so the healthcare team and the designers were constantly in a back and forth on how to fix these things or to tinker with the technology in practice and see, oh, well, if we do it like this and only download the international language version, then it works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think maybe where I fall into this binary a little bit is when I'm trying to tell the story. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I talk about Dr. Pant Pai coming up with this idea um, and kind of trying to develop this app with her team, I do classify that as development in some ways, but there's many, many research uh, protocols, research studies that kind of happen along the way. Unfortunately, I was only privy to one very detailed part of the study and another one after it concluded. Um, so I think in trying to tell this story, I was trying to make it relatable to people because they can see these different stages of development. But absolutely not in chapter five, I, I want to show that this implementation and development processes are completely together. The app is not one thing. Um, in my conclusion, I also reflected on this because for me it was hard. I always tried to see what the app was doing at the very beginning versus everyone else. Um, and that got frustrating and frustrating, and that's why in that last empirical mm -hmm. chapter I wanted to kind of grapple with this. So I would say that I agree with you and that I disagree with a, a development implementation binary. Um, I do think that because I'm talking to other audiences, sometimes, and by other audiences I mean other designers, mm -hmm. developers, researchers, and policy makers, it's easier to tell that story at the beginning and then kind of show how that falls apart in practice. Um, so that's what I tried to do. Actually, I'm very relieved, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> Indeed, in chapter five, there it's all there. Eh? So I, I got a couple of your, of your quotes. I will not uh, uh, rephrase them here. So that was also for me the reason why I thought it's all there, it's all there. But now I realize, and I think you really took a wise decision to stick to this structure because of your audience. And I think that's important that we always have to realize who is our audience and that we can have these kind of uh, discussions within our own, uh, say, circle of uh, STS scholars. So, no, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to hear this uh, convincing uh, reason. But I have another question as well. Um, because you nicely demonstrate that there's not one app, there are multiple. There are many practices. Um, um, so, if I look at the way you describe this technology, it's not stable, it changes over time, it's not fixed, it's practice dependent, and it has a very hybrid identity. Uh, it beyond these classical boundaries. So it's really, really situated with a capital S. So that's marvelous, actually. Yet, you um, then confront it with the double, uh, WHO guidelines, which come up with a kind of, uh, yeah, say, uh, one size fits all. And you show that here is a big tension in your dissertation. You plea for a new way of evaluation. And if I would say you, you come up with what I would call a situated evaluation. Now, if I would offer you a job, Ricky, and say, join us, I'm a member of the WHO, join us at the drawing table and help us to rephrase our guidelines. And you already set up ideas, but I think what you show in, in the, the last part of your dissertation that still, there's still quite a gap how to translate your ideas of alignment, for example, to real guidelines, so to say. And I don't expect that right now you come up with these kind of phrases, but at least can you try to go beyond your recommendations to take the next step towards something which would result in guidelines? Thank you again for your question. And I love this question because there's something I've wanted to talk about a bit more. Um, and can you make your answer not too long? Oh yes, sorry. <laughs> then I will make it the one she thing wanted I wanted to, to talk, talk about. about um, aside from actually looking at all the practices, the novel practices that come up, one of the things is by paying closer attention to the amount of work and effort. Mm -hmm. So all these extra things that have to happen to make it work, it draws attention to the fact that 
if you want to implement technologies, we need way more resources and infrastructure. These are not easy fixes. And in addition to the technology itself, that actually means we need to invest far more in clinical infrastructure. So for me, it's not necessarily even particular questions or guidelines. It's finding ways of putting it on paper so we can show people who make decisions, look at all the additional work and, and resources we need to actually make this successful. So it's guidelines for the guidelines. Yes. I got it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for keeping it short. <laughs> um, then our next opponent is present online. Hopefully, it's Professor Mashamba Thompson, Professor of Implementation Science for Point of Care Diagnostic at the University of Pretoria. Professor Mashamba, are you there? Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm going to put my video on, and as uh, the candidate will be very familiar with our problem, technological problems and challenges here in South Africa. I'm currently in a power cut, and you can, you can see I'm in the dark, so you can't see my face, but you can see me smile. So, uh, candidate, and uh, I, I have. Um, I have a question for the candidate. Uh, this uh, before I ask the question, the two questions. Uh, I think it would be best if I put my video off because you really can't see me. Although you can see me waving, uh, I am I'm using my backup system, and you can't see my face though because I'm in the dark. But you can hear me, I hope. So uh, before I ask the question, I'd like to. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'd like to commend the candidate and the, the supervisors for conducting this very important study um, uh, that covers a, a component of, uh, you know, of the health technologies that is usually ignored, a component of uh, user experience. So in, in often times when we are assessing the, you know, this, the suitability of health technologies such as this, we, we, we tend to ignore the user experience and the candidate has covered that very well in this ethnographic study. Also, I have not seen many ethnographic studies in the, in the area of point of care diagnostics uh, in, 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 in our region in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I was very happy to, you know, to be reading about this and seeing how you've taken into consideration the context and the nature of the population in our context in, in, in relation to this uh, technology. So um, my question, I have two questions. The first one is in relation to, um, it's just context related in relation to the requirements in South Africa for, for conducting research in uh, health facilities. Um, I can see in your thesis, in the ethics section, you talk about the, the, the the, the ethics bodies that offered you ethical approval to conduct this study in South Africa, Cape Town, and in Canada. And, um, but I do not see, in, in, in terms of South Africa, I don't see you mentioning permissions uh, or key, what is it called? It's called um, gatekeeper permissions to conduct a study in, a, in, in the health facility in South Africa. I can see that some of the work you did in this ethnographic study was uh, uh, involved you conducting research in health in the health facility. Um, should I move on to the second question or, uh, so that you can answer both? The second question really is um, in, in relation to, I, I, I'm probably making too much of an assumption that you do not speak <laughs> Isikosa and Africans. So I just want you to share with us an experience, the experience you've had conducting an ethnographic study in South Africa among a population group that doesn't predominantly speak English. You, uh, I mean, I believe that some of the people you were interacting with, the users of this app, were Isikosa speaking people and Africans in speaking people. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm jumping too much into an assumption. And if that wasn't the case, I would like to know why these populations were not involved or why you were not interacting with non-English speaking population. Thank you. Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for these questions. And I really appreciate that you take 
uh, took the time to be with us today. Um, in terms of the health facilities and ethical approval, first, um, one thing to mention is this is also part of a broader research study that was also conducted. Um, so there was multiple levels of ethical clearance involved in that. But the other thing to actually remember for this was that I say clinic, but in my second chapter, I also mention that I use clinic quite use loosely. The way that the study was set up is there was separate structures um, behind many of the clinics. So I wasn't necessarily sitting in the clinic itself uh, where people are coming in and out. I was sitting in a separate space that had been built and, and specifically designated for the research study. Um, in relation to question two about the issue of English, most of the population that I worked with um, actually spoke quite a bit of English. There were people who maybe needed support at times uh, with COSA and translation. And in those cases, we always had people around who could help us with that translation and sit in on the interview. Um, it wasn't actually only COSA. I also had lots of people who spoke Shona. Um, so sometimes it was also a bit of tinkering with the translation. Um, and we always had to find kind of, yeah, in the moment ways of dealing with this. I have to be honest, there was one word, I think, in COSA that I still remember because I, in my interviews, always wanted to understand more about people's process. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember that word being goba or why. So um, for me, that was something that was constantly kind of thrown out and used. So again, we always had to kind of find new ways of dealing with if people needed a bit of translation help, but there were people available who helped us in doing that. It wasn't just English, but the majority of people were able to kind of express themselves and their experiences in English with me. Thank you, candidate. Thank you, Vicky. Okay, then we continue with the next opponent and that's already the last opponent which is Dr. Spremenberg. She is Associate Professor Health Innovation and Digitalization at Maastricht University. Professor Spremenberg, Dr. Spremenberg. <laughs> uh, dear uh, candidate, uh, I've been researching uh, the use of digital technologies in healthcare already for uh, a few years, and I really enjoyed your dissertation. I would like to compliment you and also your team uh, and especially because uh, you look at the use of digital technology uh, through ethno using ethnographic uh, research and the influence of context. And it really gave me uh, some new insights. Uh, and look at me today. Uh, I indicated yesterday that uh, I want to hold this meeting online because I'm coughing all the time. I did a self-test, but it was negative. Uh, but I did still didn't dare to attend your defense online. Uh, I was afraid because if I, if I cough, I will uh, affect your defense, but also maybe other people will think that I have COVID. Uh, so I was also a little bit shy and maybe also embarrassed by my cough. And I really think that that story you, you told very uh, nicely in your dissertation. Uh, and I'm very glad that uh, after uh, the Corona crisis, it's possible for me to attend your defense online and it's, I'm still able to have a discussion with you. And I, maybe I don't really want to have a discussion with you, but I need your advice. Um, and I need your advice on three aspects, but let's, let's first uh, deal with the first uh, 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 problem. Um, I'm currently involved in a large study in which I uh, use artificial intelligence. Uh, we use data from primary care, secondary care, uh, that is used to predict uh, a person's risk of uh, cardiovascular problems later in life. Um, we develop uh, the app through all the phases of design thinking, uh, but while talking with uh, caregivers and our research team, uh, the idea arose to even let people fill in this questionnaire, for example, in a supermarket, and then based on, uh, then they can fill in some questions, then they receive a risk for cardiovascular diseases. And based on this, they receive recommendations to improve their lifestyle. And I'm not really a fan of this, uh, but um, uh, for example, uh, when you're a smoker, you can see that if I, when I stop smoking, I can reduce my risk uh, of cardiovascular problems by let's say 30%. 
but um, candidate, suppose, uh, and I will offer you a job too, uh, we, get, we will get funding to involve you as a postdoc in this research. What you, would you focus on and what are the things you would like to consider in this research? Dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, if I just want to repeat it quickly to ensure I understood it correctly. So you had, uh, you're had you collecting uh, data and using AI um, with data from primary care to look at CVD problems and then giving lifestyle recommendations based on people's current status to understand what, yes. yeah, okay. And how do you want to introduce that in the supermarket? Um, I appreciate the question. Um, I'm going to go back to something I mentioned actually in my presentation, which is that of the issue that you can't have conversations with an app. And I'd be curious to know in the app that you're using that's giving lifestyle recommendations, how those are given, um, how they're phrased, and what people actually do with those afterwards. Because I could imagine if someone gets a lifestyle recommendation, like you said, to quit smoking, um, that's the end of the conversation. Whereas if I went to my doctor, I would hope that if they were having a conversation with me about quitting smoking, that would be a much broader conversation. They might know that it's something I do after dinner to take five minutes for myself to get out of the house away from my kids, or that I have a really stressful job and that's my way of coping with things. They might also know that I have an anxiety disorder. So my issue or something I'd want to know is actually how the app deals with that. Or does it push them back into care? Um, I'd want to know. Oh. I'm not a fan of, of, of. I'm echoing. Is it um, okay? I'm not a fan of of of, of providing such an app uh, uh, in a supermarket because I think um, it's better to have a blended care. Uh, that indeed, as you say, there are factors that uh, should be considered also within the patient-nurse uh, interaction. Um, but what kind of research should I do to, to, to find out which, what, what the context factors are and what is so important? This is an easy one for me. I'd probably say you'd want to do ethnographic work um, because you'd want to understand yeah. what kind of situation you're working in. If you're going to do this in a grocery store, you'd also want to know what kind of communities you're working with. What are the needs and things that they're concerned about? Um, if you're just offering an app to people in the grocery store and then sending them lifestyle recommendations home, it also might be that you need much more information about the kinds of spaces that they're living in, what kinds of uh, resources they have mm -hmm. to kind of make these changes. So if it were me, I'd want to speak to people, spend time in the spaces they're working with. A grocery store doesn't tell you a lot about mm -hmm. someone's personal situation, right? Um, it might be in a particular neighborhood. Yeah, but, but, but I'm right, yeah? ethnographic uh, uh, research, I think that that should be uh, uh, one, the ideal situation to come up with these, uh, these factors and to gain insight in it. But what I also see in my research is that my research is most of the time slower than the developers of the technology, but also the healthcare sector uh, aims for. Uh, for example, we did we did a large uh, project on accelerometers. Uh, it was uh, I think we we spent four years of talking with people, gaining insight. But at the end of our uh, research, uh, the step counter uh, was standard in mobile phones. So we were too late, uh, uh, and and our research was a little bit outdated. So can we do your research in a much faster way? My general, yeah, I'd actually go back to one of my propositions for this because one of the things we talk about a lot in the global health program um, and also in STS in relation to global health is this idea of slow research. So I would say actually maybe the idea is ethnographic work does take time, even if you do it rapidly, these things take time. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't look at trying to shorten these things to the point where actually you're losing a lot of the texture and richness that ethnographic work is supposed to give you in the first place. Um, one of the things I wonder about in doing this is what kind of relationships you actually have with the technology designers and developers. Because I think as they move quickly, it's still also something to be in contact and in discussion, ongoing discussion with people mm -hmm. doing this research on the ground what kinds of things you're seeing. It's not at the end of your four re your research thing, you give someone a report and say, oh, here's all the things we found. 
this has to be an ongoing dialogue. And I think this comes back maybe yeah. to Dr. Messman's question a little bit too. Um, so this idea that we don't actually separate development design and implementation, these are things that should be happening together. I think technology is always going to be a little bit faster than the way that we can yeah, pick up and, and relate to this in terms of further research. Mm -hmm. But I think having those kinds of on ongoing discussions with the technology developer and um, qualitative or ethnographic researchers through time also allows them to maybe find different ways of doing their technology development, which might also be something that's mm -hmm. at stake for the people designing. Um, so my question or my answer would not be to speed things up, but maybe change the way that these kinds of results are being reflected, communicated, and played with within a team of designers, developers, and researchers. And even then, I noticed that there are a lot of uh, different interests and, and also conflicts uh, uh, because uh, um, uh, an organization or, or, or an industry, they want to earn money and as, as soon as possible. But, but, but let, let's go to uh, uh, another aspect that I need from you. Uh, in my research and teaching, I try to teach students and researchers that it's not uh, all about technology, that it is very uh, important to have a good understanding of the problem for one is uh, seeking um, and developing digital technology. And uh, most often I uh, say, okay, we, um, I present uh, the five phases of design thinking where we should uh, first want to uh, really uh, empathize on the problem, define the problem, make a prototype, uh, test this out in, uh, in real life. Um, and when you look at your context factors, um, in what phase of this design thinking, uh, with its iterative in my uh, uh, respect, oh, uh, Sure, very short answer. Um, I think this is about positionality, and I would wonder who's actually defining the problem, um, even if you are trying to empathize with certain problems, and how those people that define the problem are included through the design and implementation process. <laughs> that was a very quick answer. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Spreeuwbeer. Uh, Ricky Jansen, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed, and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes.
to the south side mm -hmm. Ten miles in my rearview mirror I know what it felt like My goal's only getting clearer East side to the west side mm -hmm. No place like home If there's questions that you've got Go the extra mile and die on the dash, got my laces tied. Long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because fate decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park, cause we're taking off. Get the
Ricky Janssen. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Krummeig is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Please all rise. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby, hereby confer upon you, Ricky Janssen, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached to custom, custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree, <coughs> certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Uh, I give the floor to Dr. Engel for the laudatio. I think, can you hear me? Yeah? The other one? Too tall. Dear Ricky, can you hear me now? Yeah. Dear Ricky, you've made it. <laughs> you wrote a great book and defended your PhD in front of the public. And Please speak into the microphone. <laughs> Multiple problems. Dear Ricky, You've made it. You wrote a great book and defended your PhD in front of the public and academic colleagues and friends and family today, meeting all the requirements and expectations that come with such an endeavor. I hope that along the way, throughout these past years and also including today, you also met your own requirements and wishes with regard to this research and your own role in it. <clears throat> when we met and started talking about the project that became your PhD, you had just finished your master thesis in global health, for which you had done a great job conducting fieldwork in Sudan. I'm not sure a PhD was really on your mind at that point. Neither was it what we were offering, to be perfectly honest. At the time, Nikki and I were looking for someone who could conduct a qualitative ethnography alongside the HIV SMART evaluation studies that Nikki was planning in South Africa. Nikki had a firm belief that qualitative research would be of benefit alongside the clinical and epidemiological research, and we were building on our past and joint experiences with studying diagnostic processes across the health systems in India and South Africa. There was sadly not enough funding for a formal Dutch IO position, so we were, PhD position that is, so we were looking for a junior researcher, and we thought we, if we were lucky, we maybe get a nice publication out of this. You happily took the opportunity and enthusiastically embarked on this journey. When you came back from the first field work, and um, Nikki, Anya, and I, and you had the first meetings about data analysis, it became clear that there were data, ideas, and especially enthusiasm for an entire PhD. Once that idea was born, we became more ambitious and added more field work and another field site. You became fascinated with all these questions around diagnosing infectious and stigmatized diseases such as HIV, doing this with different forms of support and the role of digital technologies in diagnosing. You love spending time with your empirical data. Every time we met, you had peeled off another layer of meaning from your recordings, notes, and observations. 
Staying close to the data and true to those who gave their time and insights for this research is something that I believe is very close to your heart. <coughs> Looking back, it was an exciting but not always an easy journey. First, you had to carve out a space for this type of work and find your position within the study project on the ground, but also the larger field of self-testing and digital health. This involved conquering your own insecurities about your own research and writing <coughs> and establishing the uniqueness of your findings in the context of an app-based project. It involved, be it involved being persistent, at times to the point it might have felt a little annoying to you and possibly to others. <coughs> <coughs> Requesting an interview can feel as if you are forcing the wrong priority onto someone else at a time of ill health, overburdened clinics, understaffed health systems, and competing research priorities. But thanks to your persistence, Ricky, and the belief of Nikki in this work, we now have in-depth insights into how the different actors you studied made HIV smart work. These insights are so important and crucial because they can now help explain the success of the formal evaluation studies and the outstanding epidemiological results. <coughs> Along the way, I think you also grew as a person and showed a high level of reflection about the moments you spent in the clinic and among the study team. Second, you had to face uncertainties in terms of funding and your own position at the university. As mentioned, this was not a formal PhD position, no. um, which usually, which usually sorry, comes with 0.8 FDE protected research time over a number of years. <coughs> no. Ricky conducted this PhD on a creatively patched together funding scheme that supplemented the initial project funding. This meant for you, Ricky, that you always had a heavy teaching load of 0.5 FTE. Everyone with teaching here knows that this in reality often takes much more time. <coughs> and it also meant, sadly, that at several moments in time, we did not know whether there would be funding the next year. This was very hard. But you persisted despite these uncertainties, and stoically continued to work on your PhD, even though it might not always have felt that stoically inside you. <coughs> Third, you had to deal with three supervisors and a project team that were interdisciplinary and dispersed across the world. While this made for great research and exciting meetings, at times this distance created painful misunderstandings that needed tending and amending. But in the end, this made you a stronger collaborator and researcher, and I think allowed you to grow as a person again. The connections to FASOS that you actively sought were also an important source of support. You always came back from these meetings and workshops with newfound confidence and inspiration. Fourth, you had to be very resilient in completing this thesis throughout the COVID-19 <coughs> pandemic. Finalizing a PhD is most often an arduous task that takes an emotional an emotional toll on the author, um, most of us here can speak from experience, <coughs> <laughs> but, this was like, but this was likely even harder during the pandemic. And finally, Ricky, you had to grapple with your own inner critic. Most of us know this inner critic rather too well. Naturally, our supervisor meetings now and then ventured into the more personal domains. Throughout these conversations, I have come to regard you as a very sweet, thoughtful, loyal and warm person, <coughs> much liked by her friends, peers, and highly regarded among the students. You can become emotional and an outspoken critic if you observe injustices within the university system. And you have a keen eye for students' needs and have grown into an experienced teacher. Dear Ricky, that you persisted throughout these uncertainties and did not lose sight, and most importantly, stayed excited and enthusiastic about the topic and the importance of your approach really says a lot about who you are as an academic and a colleague. Loyal, committed, persistent, and thoughtful. Congratulations from all of us, also on behalf of Nikki and Anya. We hope you can truly enjoy reaching the end of this journey while embarking with the same open heart on new ones to come. Dear Dr. Janssen, 
Also on behalf of Maastricht University, I would like uh, to congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. You had really a good defense and I hope you, also you yourself, enjoyed it because it was worth it. Um, I'd like to congratulate you family, friends, colleagues here present and maybe present online. Um, I'd like to congratulate your supervising team, Professor Kromeich, uh, Dr. Engel, present here, and Dr. Pai, who is online. Congratulations with this uh, degree. I also would like to thank the members of the degree committee here present and also present online, especially the people from outside our university, Professor Van Hooijwegen and Professor Mashamba all the way in South Africa. Thank you for attending this uh, defense. We really appreciate uh, your contribution. Uh, and now it's uh, time to relax. And uh, with this, I'd like to close this academic session. I would like to ask the audience uh, to leave uh, the auditorium. We stay here a little bit longer to take some pictures, but then uh, we will join you in the after. Thank <laughs> you.